Thank you, musicians, for some good beginning music to our, our service today. Oh, I'm glad to welcome you on this beautiful Sunday. We've had a parade of beautiful day, have, days, have we not? Anyway, we're glad that you're here and hope that you are blessed by the worship experience that we share today. And I want to especially welcome those who are worshiping with us online. If you've chosen to tune in with us today, we're glad that you are here. And if you see any things that you like, there is a website that you can go to and a, uh, an email that you can sign up for on that website that will allow you to know more about what happens here at Hope. If you are with us for the first time today, there is some, we're in front of you in the backs of the pews, a um, card called the Connect Card. And you can fill it out and tell us who you are. And if you have prayer requests that you would like to share with us, they are there in, in the back of the pew. And at the end of the service, we'll be receiving the offering, and you can put those cards in the offering basket as it comes around. And while we're talking about offering baskets, uh, the offering baskets are for members of, uh, of Hope Church. And if you are a, a visitor with us, we just want you to feel welcome and at home, and you don't have to put anything in there except the Connect card. We'd love it if you'd do that. Two or three things that I want to call to your attention. Uh, the planning team for our congregation-wide prayer mobilization has met this last Tuesday, and we're getting ramped up, and very soon we'll be sharing with you the methods and, and the ways we're going to carry out this congregation-wide praying. And it will show you how you can pray and how you can share what God is saying to you and listen, enable you to listen to also to what God is saying to other people as well. So keep in touch. We will be talking with you a bit more in the, in the weeks to come about how we're going to do that. Uh, we have a sister church in Cuba, and one of the former pastors of that church is going to be in our area on the 27th of March, and he has offered to preach for us, and I said yes. <laughs> so I'm eager to meet him and to learn about the church. He's now a district superintendent of one of the districts in, uh, in Cuba, and we're looking forward to him coming. It'll be all three services on March the 27th. Do you believe that Ash Wednesday is already here? March the 2nd, this coming Wednesday, is Ash Wednesday, signaling the beginning of Lent and our preparation time for the celebration of Easter. And on this Ash Wednesday from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, 
Uh, I and Kristen and Amy are going to be out in the driveway along with David. David's going to be playing guitar. And as you drive through, we will give you the mark of the ash, and we will also give you some materials that you can use for your devotional life on Ash Wednesday itself and also for the whole season of Lent. If you are able to come at 7 p.m. that night, we will have a full worship service, probably the last 30 to 40 minutes, and uh, it will be a bit more of an introspective time, a time of preparation, a time of quieting oneself. It will be a good way for you to begin the Lenten season. So we hope you'll come to hopefully the, to the evening service, but if you can't come there, then you can do the what we call the drive through blessing at 7 o'clock, between 7 and 8 in the morning. So I'm glad you're here, and I hope you will be blessed by all that we do and say together in this worship service. Let's take a look now at who we are. At Hope, we commit to connecting with God, each other, and our community while becoming mature followers of Jesus Christ. Together, we will experience God and share the love of Jesus. Please pray with me. Oh, Lord God, we are so grateful to you for who you are, and we are glad that you are here with us, even as we have gathered. Fill us with your Spirit. Teach us, grow us, help us to become more like Jesus because of what we're doing here together today. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. And if you would please stand and greet each other in the peace of Christ. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning, Robert. Good morning. So point a bob and your monitor and go up. All right, let's hear your voices. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. But then I saw lightning from heaven. And I never been the same yet. Yeah. I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I'm a child of love. I found the world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. I felt the sting of the fire, but I saw you in the flames. Just when I thought it was. So
we pray that we can all be children of love, that we could always worship your name and, and put you over, over everything, God. We love you so much. We thank you for this day, this morning. We thank you that it's so beautiful outside. We could come in this place and lift our voices to you, Lord. Please be with us and let, help us to encounter you, God. If you would join in singing, me, singing with me here. Great in power, exalted and lifted high. God, you will reign forever. Forever we will glorify God over all, 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 God over all. Please continue to sing with me as we lift our voices to the Lord. 
Oh, Lord, it's good to be in this quiet time just to let our hearts open to receive what you will say to us and how you will deal with us this day. We are thankful for so much of who you are and what you do for us. And we've come here to praise and to worship you and to give thanks that your love is beyond all our understanding. We confess, O oh Lord, that we have not been perfect in our loving. Forgive us for our sins of omission and commission. And now, O oh Lord, we make petitions to you. We lift up to you concerns that we have. Please bless the efforts of those who are working to stem the rise of the coronavirus. Guide them in their to, the, to success so that we all are able to be free from this debilitating disease. 
heal those who have become infected, restore them to health, and keep safe those who tend the sick, the doctors, nurses, and first responders. We thank you so much for their willingness to sacrifice. Comfort, O oh Lord, those who have lost loved ones. Fill the emptiness and voids in, on the inside of them because of the loss of relationships and fill them with your love and grace. And we cry out for healing for ourselves and for those whom we love. We name them before you in our hearts, and in addition to those that we name, Lord, heal these as well. Will and Michael and Jensen and Ski, Sheila and Lee and Jim and Kevin, Kathy and Beth and Eric and Ted, Kendra, Rita, Karen, and Charlene. And we dare, O oh Lord, to pray for healing for those whose names we do not know and whom we cannot call. Bless them, heal them. O oh Lord, bless your church worldwide. There is so much need in our world for the message that the church bears. Help us to be effective in sharing the good news of Jesus. Show us the ways to be the body of Christ in those places of hunger and disease and conflict and war. Soften our hearts to those suffering amongst us. Oh Lord, give us ears to hear the purpose you have in mind for Hope United Methodist Church. Draw us all into a time of praying. Make us sensitive to your Spirit's leading so we share in bringing your kingdom to come. Bless our Cuban sister church, Pedro Betancourt, in their food and sharing ministries. And we pray your blessings on their former pastor as he comes to be with us at the end of this month. Keep him safe on the journey and bless the purposes for which he has come. Bless the teachers and administrators in our schools, how difficult it is to work in those environments these days. Show us how to encourage and support them, strengthen them in their vital work. Oh Lord, bless Emmaus Walk 25. The team and the pilgrims are, are gathering soon, and we pray that you will visit your spirit on them and it will be a tremendously growing experience for each one of them. We pray now for our country and for our world. Bless all those in administrative, legislative, and judicial offices. Prod them to listen to you and to cooperate with each other, envisioning and working for the future for our country and the world that you intend. Bless our president. Give Joe Biden and those who advise him a filling of your spirit so that they will lead our country in ways you ordain. Lord, we're mindful of so much that's happening in our world with respect to armed conflict. We remember the people of Ukraine. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as things appear to be ramping up some, that you will stir some cool heads and give them words to speak to each other that will reduce the tensions and they will be led to find a way to live together and to coexist peacefully. Bless everyone who is a part of this worship time. Touch us with your Holy Spirit, your holy love. Walk alongside us, Lord. Guide us into a bright and fulfilling future. It is in the name of Jesus, who whom we pray taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Please be seated. As I begin to read the text for the, for the day, it's only one verse long, but I'd like you to remember that the text for these sermons in these weeks is really the whole of chapter 3 of Colossians. It's a chapter in which Paul is trying to instruct us about how Christians behave in the world. And reading it over and over again, new things will appear to you as you read it time after time. So I'm going to read Colossians 3, verse 11 only. And it begins with the word here, and he's really talking about the community of faith. Within the bonds of the community of faith, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. May God add his blessings to the reading and our understanding of his holy word. Amen. I begin this sermon the way I have for the last two, by reminding you that your life is hidden with Christ in God. Another way of thinking about that is to say, what does it mean to live a Christ-like life? What does a Christ-like life look like? And it's in that context that we talk today, even as we have in previous Sundays. There's a gentleman by the name of William Barclay. He is dead now. He was an English pastor, and he was a scholar also, and he is responsible for writing the Barclay's New Testament commentary. 17 volumes commentary on the New Testament. Practically any pastor you have ever heard preach has at least read and used some of Barclay's material. He is widely known. And I'm going to use a little bit of his stuff today in my, my talking with you. A quote from Barclay, one of the great effects of Christianity is that it destroys, it destroys barriers. The ancient world of Paul's time in which Colossians was written, was full of barriers. The Greeks were the aristocrats of the world. They looked down on barbarians, and a barbarian was anybody who wasn't Greek. And the Jews looked down on all the other nations. They were God's chosen, were they not? And the Scythians, as Paul names them here, were the lowest of the low, the lowest of the barbarians. There's a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. He's one of the few historians of that time period about the uh, time of Jesus' life that we have much in the way of written works from. But Josephus is one that we do. And he wrote about the Scythians. He described them as proverbial savages who terrorized the civilized world with their bestial atrocities. Slaves, according to ancient law, were not even human beings. They were living tools with no rights of their own. They could not marry. A master could kill them at any whim, and there could be no fellowship of the ancient world between slave and free. Now, hold that for a second, and I want you to, to turn your attention to a book of the Bible called Philemon. It's at, right before Hebrews. It's one chapter long. And it is a letter of Paul to a man named Philemon who had a slave named Onesimus. And it seems as the story unfolds in that book of Philemon, Onesimus had run away from Philemon. That was reason enough to kill him because he ran away. But he had become a Christian under Paul's leadership or at least in one of the churches that Paul founded. And Paul now is writing a letter to Philemon and said, Philemon, I prevail upon you to take back your slave, Onesimus. Take him back not as a slave, but as a brother, because he has become a Christian. I offer this letter to you as a way of, of demonstrating how the Christian faith at that time broke down the barriers. There was barrier between master and slave. But Paul is 
in joining Philemon out of his love for Christ to receive Onesimus back and not punish him as he had a legal right to do, even to the point of killing him, take him back as a brother, a part of the church. In Christ, barriers were broken down. One of the greatest tributes paid to Christianity was paid not by a theologian, but by a 19th century linguist by the name of Max Buehler. He was a great expert in the science of language, one of the first, as a matter of fact. In the ancient world, no one was interested in foreign languages except Greek. Greek was the aristocratic language. Everybody would like to speak that. That was what was holding the society and culture together. But the Greeks themselves, while they were scholars and aristocrats, they would have considered it beneath themselves to even speak or try to speak the language of the barbarians. The science of language is a new science, and the desire to know other languages is a new desire. And Max Mueller wrote this, not until that word barbarian was struck out of the dictionary of mankind and replaced by brother, not till the right was recognized of all nations of the world to be classified as one genus or kind, can we even look for the first beginnings of the science of language. This change was affected by Christianity. It was Christianity that drew people together enough to make them want to know each other and their languages. Christianity was instrumental in breaking down barriers. There were barriers of birth and nationality. Different nations who despised each other were drawn together in one family in the church. People of different nationalities who would have leaped at each other's throats in other settings sat in peace with each other at the table of the Lord. And then there were the barriers of ceremony and ritual. Circumcised and uncircumcised were drawn together into one fellowship. To the Jews, people of other nations were unclean and should be shunned. But when men and women became Christians, they became brothers and sisters, no matter what their race, race or nationality was. And then there were the barriers between the cultured and the uncultured. The Scythians were the ignorant barbarians of the world, and the Greeks were the aristocrats of learning. But the cultured and the uncultured came together in the church. The greatest scholar and the most humble laborer could sit in perfect fellowship inside the church. And when I'm talking about the church, please understand, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the fellowship that the word church describes or refers to. And then there were barriers between classes. Slave and free came together in the church. More than that, in the early church, it could and did happen that the slave would become the leader of the, of the congregation and the master a humble member. In the presence of God, the distinctions of the world become irrelevant. In God's plan for things, what I have just described is the way things are supposed to work. And they do work that way when Jesus is fully embraced. When we yield to him not only as our Savior, that's easy for us to do because we are the beneficiaries of being forgiven for our sins. But it's a bit more problematic when we accept him as Lord because that means we are accepting restrictions on how we live, what we say, how we behave, what we do with the things that are entrusted to us. Because people accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, the church grew. It grew from a tiny, small group in a remote part of the Roman Empire to become the dominant faith of the world. People shared with each other their own personal experience of God's amazing love. They did it around dinner tables in their homes, and the message spread like wildfire. 
Hearts were changed. Barriers came down. They had been transformed, and they could not keep quiet about it. There was very little formal organization of the church back then. It just happened person to person, friend to friend, family member to family member. Well, can that light shine again? Can the growth of faith in Jesus Christ again spread like wildfire? Can it shine on our own personal attitudes? Can we begin to see what is in us that obstructs the full realization of Colossians 3.11 that here in our community of faith there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. And we could put our modern day divisions in that passage and say, none of those divisions exist here either. It happened that way for a man, a New Orleans lawyer named John Cummings. He bought the Whitney Plantation in Wallace, Louisiana in 1990, and he renovated it. It was a 1,700-acre plantation originally owned by a German immigrant family. It was mainly a sugar-growing plantation, and records from that plantation still survive today. And if you were to go to look at the ledger for 1860, you would see that they owned 101 black slaves, each listed in that ledger by name, gender, age, complexion, skill set, and country of origin. John Cummings' stated goal when he bought the plantation was to acknowledge the shameful history of slave ownership in the South and to honor the slaves who once lived on the plantation. He was a man with a changed heart. In an interview, Cummings was asked why a white man would be so interested and involved in revealing the truth about the plantation's history. He replied, don't you remember? It was a white man who caused all this. In the same interview, he was asked if he felt guilty. He said he didn't feel guilt anymore. He had moved past the guilt and into a stage of lament. Let that word settle in your spirit, lament. What do you lament about, about something that's gone horribly wrong and you're deeply sad about it. In the same interview, um, he also said he admitted he could not do anything to change the injustices of the past, but he hoped to change some of the effects of slavery by looking at the truth and owning it. If you would like to, you can go to Wallace, Louisiana today, and you can arrange a, a tour of the Whitney Plantation. You will have a guide that will tell you the truth about what slave life was like on that plantation, about the forced to labor, the beatings, the rapes, the murders. Jesus announced that the kingdom of God is here but it's not yet. It is here, but it's not here to the full. There have been some sad, sad, sad chapters in human history and in the history of the church. The attempts that we have made to follow God have sometimes run awfully awry. In the latter stages of the Roman Empire, after the Christian faith had become the religion of the empire, evangelism was done by the sword. You defeat the enemy, you take them down to the river, and you give each person a chance to receive Christ or not. And if the answer is yes, you are baptized and uh, you are okay. If you say no, you are killed. So evangelism was sort of a stark choice. Crusades to retake the Holy Land, to, to make it pure again for the, for the Christian church. 
in the process of doing that, untold hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Not so much of a testimony to the Prince of Peace, is it? Inquisitions were held in the 1200s and 1400s to purify the faith of the church. Torture and execution were typical tools used by the inquisitors on the people they were trying to ascertain whether they were properly Christian or not. There were witch trials in this country with essentially the same purpose in mind, to purify the community of faith. And then beginning in the 1700s, there were schools to civilize, in quotes, the Native Americans. It was a systematic attempt to erase Native American culture. And that happened beginning in the 1700s and lasted until the early 1900s. Between 1882 and 1968, over 4,000 mostly black men were lynched. And many of those lynchings were carried out by people who were members of churches. Jim Crow laws depriving black folks of their basic rights existed in this country from the 1870s until the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Japanese internment camps during World War II imprisoned American citizens for no other reason than that they were of Japanese ancestry. So we have blacks versus whites. We have Asians versus blacks. We have Republicans versus Democrats. We have Muslims versus, Christian Muslim, versus, versus Christians. We have Muslims versus the People's Republic of China. Russia versus Ukraine. Hindu versus Muslim. Rich versus poor. And I am certain you could add to the list. These are all barriers which exist now. And many people are yearning for God, or many people are yearning, and God is yearning for the kingdom of God to come fully. All the way. For the barriers to come down. For us to live together in peace and in love, that's what the kingdom vision is. So now you, you say, Kendall, what do you want me to do about all of this? I don't know. It is so big a problem. It has so many sides and, and places to, to begin to plug into it. I don't know where to start. But I do know this, that the world is in great need of people who know Jesus, who desperately want to build bridges over the hate and fear which comes at us daily. So much of the politics of our world is based on making us afraid of some group or something. Perfect love, that is the love of God, the agape love that Paul talked about in Corinthians 13 and, and Jesus talked about when he was on the earth. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has no place in the community of faith in the kingdom of God. The scriptures tell us that perfect love casts out fear. And it is that love which has intersected our lives and calls us to reflect that love wherever we are and whomever we are with. Can you? Will you be such a bridge where you live? Can you, will you, partner with others of like mind, like mind, to be bridges where you live?
here there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And I would add to that list of things that you see on the screen, all the other divisions that you see at work in human society. Christ is all and Christ is in all. And we must bear witness to that. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you in the... In the music that's going to follow now to uh, simply reflect on what you've heard. And as someone once said to me, whatever kernels of truth you have heard, may they remain. But with the breath of kindness, may God blow all the chaff away. Please think. Will the ushers please come for the offering? Oh God, you have blessed us with so much. We are overwhelmed by your love and generosity. And you only ask us to give a tithe, a tenth, 
of it back to you when it's all yours to begin with. And as we have shared with you the bounty from all that you have given us, we pray that you multiply these gifts and make them effective in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you please stand as we sing from the inside out. A thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. Your will above all else, my purpose. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. One more time. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you as you depart this place. Remember, you are Jesus' ambassadors. Amen. <laughs>